Hi, this is the fourth instalment of my Unit 5 overview and I'll be covering medical physics. So we'll be looking at various diagnostic techniques that are used in medicine that are based on physics principles. So let's get started off with it by looking at a very common and historically well-established technique uh, with x-rays and we'll, we need to know how x-rays are produced. So we'll look at that first. First up, we have to understand that X-rays are very high frequency electromagnetic radiation. Frequency in the range of 10 to the 15 to 10 to the 20 hertz, and a wavelength in the range of 10 to the minus 9 to 10 to the minus 12 meters. The way that X-rays are produced is by the deceleration of electrons. The electrons need to undergo a large deceleration that's how you should phrase it if you're ever required to do so. In an X-ray tube there are three primary components. They are the cathode, the high voltage supply across cathode and anode, and then the anode here, or sometimes called the target because we'll be firing electrons at the target. So electrons are produced here at the cathode by a process called thermionic emission. And this all takes place in the vacuum so that the electrons are not obstructed going from the cathode to the anode. So they are accelerated to a very high speed and they crash into the target metal here, usually tungsten, and they experience a large deceleration here. Then there is an energy conversion that takes place at the anode, which is the electron kinetic energy is converted into X-rays and heat. Now, most of the energy from the electron kinetic energy is converted into heat. So this is about 99% of the energy input and only 1% goes into forming X-ray photons. Hence the need for methods to keep the anode cool. So there'll be a cooling system where you can pump some coolant through the anode and then it would often be rotated as well so that you, instead of just getting one small region of the anode very hot, uh, you, by rotating it you can distribute that heat input throughout the metal. So tungsten has a high melting point, that's necessary. It has other uh, features that make it useful as a target material as well. Uh, but in addition to that high melting point, you will need to keep it cool. So that's how x-rays are produced. X-rays are then absorbed by matter, and there are three methods that are necessary for you to understand. Uh, the first process is the photoelectric effect. An X-ray photon is absorbed by an orbital electron in the matter that the X-rays are travelling through. All of the photon energy, the incoming X-ray photon, is given to the electron, giving it enough energy to escape the atom. So it's very similar to the photoelectric effect we saw in unit 2, but here the X-ray photons have a much higher amount of energy, so they can actually ionise atoms. They leave behind positive ions, so they ionise that atom. From a conservation of energy point of view, what's happening is the photon energy here, HF, goes into the work function that gives the electron enough energy to escape the atom and then the remaining energy is turned into kinetic energy so that's a half mv squared there. You need to have photons with high enough energy so the photon frequency needs to have a frequency larger than the threshold frequency where f0 is the threshold frequency. Okay. So that's how the first way in which X-rays can interact with matter and be absorbed. So you've produced them, now they're being absorbed by matter as they travel through it. Second method is by a method called Compton scattering. Here, the photon, incoming photon, collides with an electron. Again, it's an orbital electron in an atom, and it scatters. Some of the photon energy is given to the electron, and so that is sufficient energy for the electron to escape again, so the electron can escape the atom, but not all of the photon energy was required to do that, and so some photon energy is left over. So what we get 
is a scattered photon, and that photon has a frequency which is less than the in incident photon's frequency. So we get a change in frequency of the photon. F prime here indicating that that's a scattered photon's frequency. So, uh, conservation of energy, we have one object to begin with, that's the photo incident photon, which is, has energy HF. The work function, because the electron is being removed from the atom, again, there's a work function involved here. So we just give the electron enough energy to escape the atom. It has some kinetic energy afterwards. And then, because we have a, a photon afterwards as well, this photon with longer wavelength or lower frequency, then we have that photon energy also. Uh, so what we've seen in the first two processes is the removal of electrons from atoms. And as I said earlier, what we're left behind with after the electron has been removed is an ion. It's a positive ion. So X-rays, they are ionising radiation. That's what we mean by ionising radiation. They can remove electrons and leave behind those positive ions. And if those ions are in molecules, you can get some different chemical processes happening with molecules and under normal circumstances. Gamma rays are also ionising radiation. Right, and that's their harmful property. Because if that happens in cells and you get new chemical reactions taking place, that's bad times. Third interaction process is pair production. Now, the first two cases, the photon was interacting with atomic electrons. Here, it's interacting with the nucleus. What happens is the photon strikes the nucleus, and the photon energy is converted into mass and kinetic energy. So, because we're energy is being converted into mass, that's Einstein's mass energy equivalent is going to come into play there. The Mass is in the form of an electron and positron pair, so that's why it's called pair production, because whenever you, you, energy is converted into mass, it's always converted into matter and antimatter. And also, when uh, mass is converted into energy, you have matter, that, that's from matter and antimatter annihilating. Right, so here's our nucleus, there's our photon coming in, the photon is absorbed by the nucleus, and we get these the pair of particles created, the electron on the top there and the positron on the bottom. So some of the energy was turned into mass, but you notice that those electrons and positrons, they're moving away from the nucleus, and therefore there is some kinetic energy involved as well. So the conservation of energy here is, here's our incident photon energy. That's converted into mass, mc squared, and kinetic energy multiplied by two, these have identical masses, therefore the same amount of energy is required to create the mass, and they have identical kinetic energies as well, so it's multiplied by two for that reason. So, there we go. Right, uh, so that's how X-ray beams, the three processes that X-ray photons can interact with matter and be absorbed. Okay, now we're going to now, so that's looking at it at a very small scale, we'll look at it at a larger scale and just look at measuring the intensity of X-ray beams as they travel through matter. So we've seen point sources of wave energy before. Because the wave energy is spreading out from that point source, it obeys an inverse square law of distance. But if you have a collimated beam, then because the rays are parallel, you have constant intensity with distance. Okay? That's assuming that there's no other processes involved in removing energy from the beam. So when we come to look at how X-rays are absorbed in matter with distance, and looking at that relationship, we'll be considering a collimated beam. So that's what I bring it out here. So that's a, what we mean by collimated beam. So let's look at X-ray absorption and the depth of material that it's passing through. This, as the X-ray beam is travelling through the matter, you're going to have a combination of all three of the absorption processes happening 
because this matter is full of atoms, you've got atomic nuclei there, and you have atomic orbital electrons. So this is full of nuclei and electrons, and as the X-rays in the beam pass through the matter, they're going to interact with some of those. So here's our collimated beam. Okay, it's a collimated beam which is incident on our, ma on our matter here. This is the matter here. And the intensity is reduced. So if it's dark over here indicating its original intensity and it's lighter over here indicating that the intensity has been reduced. The incident intensity at the leading edge of the material is I0. And there's a, this is another case where you have exponential reductions. Uh, there's an exponential reduction of intensity with the depth. According to this relationship, I is equal to Y0 multiplied by E to the minus mu X, where mu is the linear attenuation coefficient and it has units of meters to the minus one. X is the depth of the matter there. Right. The half value thickness is the amount of material required to reduce the intensity to 50%. So I will be equal to I0 over 2. Uh, I don't know why my arrows have moved along there inconveniently, but they have, uh, so apologies for that. This same half value thickness, which is denoted X subscript half, is equal to log 2 over mu. So if you do a similar process as we saw with the radioactive decay equation, if you substitute for x half here, then that will be when i equals i0 over 2. You can rearrange that equation and find that x half is dependent on the linear attenuation coefficient. So it's log 2 again, which is 0 0.693 to 3SF, divided by the linear attenuation coefficient. So now we can see, that we can have a look at the graph. Um, the, the amount of absorption, and here we're thinking in particular of a medical scenario, so we're thinking of different types of body tissue. Uh, the absorption in the material depends on the atomic number, which is Z. So in t body tissue terms, the atomic number of bone is larger than that of soft tissue. Okay, so we will experience C more absorption of x-ray beams in bone than in soft tissue okay, per unit depth. So here is our exponential decay graphs. We've got intensity against the depth here. I've plotted two graphs, one for soft tissue, one for bone. You can see the bone is falling off faster. That's because its Z number is higher. Uh, they both start at I zero, so if we have the same, in, this is where we have the same incident intensity, so that we can actually do a comparison of them. And at I zero over two, we have x half for the bone being less than x half for the soft tissue. So you need that's saying that the half value thickness for bone is smaller than for soft tissue. So you need less bone to get the same amount of absorption. Or if you had the same amount of material, bone will absorb more of the incident beam. I just want to kind of link this in, this atomic number, with the three absorption processes. When you have a larger atomic number, that means you have larger atomic nuclei. So that means there's a great chance that an X-ray photon will interact with the atomic nuclei because they're all much larger in that material. So that will increase the amount of absorption per unit depth. Then also you have more atomic electrons as well for larger Z numbers. That means you've got more electrons as well, more protons, more electrons. So there's an increased likelihood of the photoelectric effect on and scattering happening also. So that's just kind of linking in with the three atomic, uh, three interaction methods. All right, so let's look at how is used with x-ray imaging. So these are conventional x-rays at this stage. And the first person to collect an x-ray image was Wilhelm Röntgen. And this is a picture of that x-ray image. 
Quinn's x-ray of his wife's hand. And he did that in 1895. Now, that x-ray took 15 minutes to click, so that's a long time that she had to keep her hand still. It's also a long time of exposing her hand to x-rays. And we've moved on a lot since then, and you'll see some of the uh, what, certainly one of the methods that, by which we've been able to reduce the exposure time to fractions of a second. Uh, this lump here, that's her wedding ring, okay, so it's not a deformity in her bone, that's, you, you can see her bones here in her hand, and that is her wedding ring. You can see here, this is a shadow image, okay, so th this is a two-dimensional silhouette of the internal structure of her hand. This, this type of imaging enables us to see any defects in outlines of tissues that have high atomic, higher atomic number compared to the surrounding tissue. Okay? So that's, generally speaking, going to be bone, but there are cases where you can use it for analysing some other tissues also. So you can, you're looking for defects in the bones. Okay? So you get used to what x-rays should look like for... All for normal situations, uh, and then when you're examining a patient, you look at their x-rays to see if there's any obvious defects. The way that x-rays are used is they, they can be used with photographic film, but was increasingly x-rays are being used with digital methods, and you'll see the principles for that, those digital methods when we look at other imaging techniques. But anyway, photographic film is used, and photographic film starts off white, and where x-rays reach the photographic film, it turns it black. So when you have an x-ray, white areas on it indicate that there was no x-ray penetration. Okay, now this is actually the inverse of what's going on here, because this is actually a dark shadow, but in my next slide where I have a modern x-ray, you'll see and that there's no changes being made to its colour, you'll see that the white areas, that's where there was no x-ray penetration. Grey areas are where there is some penetration of x-rays, but not as much as the black areas. So you get maximum x-ray penetration here. So it's bear worth bearing in mind the white areas are actually where the shadow was cast on the photographic film. So let's have a look at x-ray image formation. Here's our photographic film, it starts off white. We then expose it to x-rays which turns the film black, but only where the x-rays reach. So now we have these black, grey and white areas. So the white areas indicate areas where very few or no x-rays manage to penetrate. Okay, so that's my spine, by the way. This is actually a chest x-ray of me. Uh, so we've got my spine here. There's also some soft tissue in front of it as well, contrib contributing to the absorption. Uh, but yeah, no x-rays got here. So they, this photographic film was essentially unchanged. There's large, there's uh, tissue there with a large mean atomic number, okay? So we've got lots of those absorption processes happening here preventing the x-rays penetrating through to the film. Then the grey areas, you know, some of the soft tissues, so there's um, some organs here. You could say this is evidence that I have a heart. Um, there's, a, out, there's an average atomic, mean atomic number for the tissues here. So the soft tissue, there's some absorption, but not as much as the dark areas. These black areas here, this is a chest x-ray, so the x-rays are going through my lungs, there's a lot of air there, that's a very low atomic number on, on average for the lungs and everything else that's penetrating through. So we've got a low atomic number, very little absorption happening there. So this is what, these black areas are where the photographic film has changed most because of most of the x-rays got through. And these conventional x-rays, they only work well when you have a high contrast between the atomic 
numbers. Okay, so this only works well because we've got a very low atomic number here and very high here, or even between some of the soft tissue areas in the bone. So you can still see some of the bone through the soft tissue there, but you need to have a high contrast in atomic numbers to get a decent image. So that means you, the x rays are really useful for finding fractures in bone because most of the surrounding tissue around the bone is soft tissue, low atomic number, you can see any defects in the bone. But, so you, can, but you can't look at the intestines because the intestines have a similar atomic number to the surrounding organs, the surrounding soft tissue. So you can't pick out any problems there. It is possible to adopt a method whereby you use a contrast medium to increase the atomic number of the organ that you're interested in so that it has a higher atomic number than the surrounding tissue. So contrast media can provide you with an increased atomic number. Here is an example of an x-ray taken with a contrast medium. So this is showing up parts of the intestines. They've taken a contrast medium into their intestines, usually by ingesting something like barium sulfate. And barium sulfate has a high atomic number, so it coats the intestines, and therefore we can now see the structure of the intestines and see if there are any problems, any constrictions, for example, in that. Okay. Sometimes this term is used to describe contrast media. They are radio opaque, so that means they are opaque to radio waves, just like this book is opaque to visible light, this is opaque to x-rays, whereas the soft tissue that it's got, it's working with, the intestines, is not radio-opaque, it's translucent, so the x-rays can penetrate it. So that's contrast media, that, so that gives you a few more cases where you can use conventional x-rays, which is an advantage because they're cheap and quick. Now I said earlier that um, the first x-ray image by Ronkham, that took 15 minutes to expose. That's a very long time. We want it to be as short as possible. The reason that it took so long is that photographic film is not very sensitive to x-rays. A lot of them are going to penetrate through it, so you're going to get, it's going to take a long time to get significant darkening of the film where the x-rays are penetrating. So what you can do is surround it with intensifying screens. So you put an intensifying screen in front of it, one in behind, and then there's these other layers just to keep it all together. So now the x-rays from the patient are penetrating through these layers as well. And this, fluorescent, this screen is fluorescing. It's a scintillating material. So when x-rays are absorbed in the intensifying screen, they turn the X-ray energy into visible light photons. So one X-ray photon is converted into many visible light photons. Let's have a look at these three layers here because that, those are the ones we're particularly interested in. So our X-rays are coming in here. There is some direct blackening of the film by X-rays. So these X-rays, they're making the, the film dark here. So we get a little bit of darkening directly. Here, the this x-ray photon was absorbed by the scintillating material, so it gives off a flash of light. It gives off um, many visible photons. Okay, so we get many visible photons, and those visible photons, they, are, they also blacken photographic film. So this is indirect film blackening by the visible light flashes. Okay, so we've got more happening here because there's many more visible photons than just the one x-ray photon that was converted into the visible light. Then we also get a blackening on the rear of the photographic film as well. And we've got another case here where the, the x-ray photon was absorbed in the screen, but now it's behind, so we get blackening there. Because we've got x-ray photons being absorbed in this material, which otherwise wouldn't have been absorbed by the film, they 
there are fewer available to actually pass straight through, whereas when we just had the film, a lot of them would have passed straight through. So that was kind of a, a double positive. We get many visible photons which darken the film quicker, and there are fewer that pass through and do nothing. So that's image intensifiers. Let's move on to CAT scans. And when I'm talking about CAT scans, I'm not talking about this, I'm not talking about a scan of some feline. We're talking about computed axial tomography, sometimes called CT scans as well. Now, CAT scans use x rays to produce images of the body in slices. Whereas with the conventional x ray, we just expose the area that we're interested in with x rays, they go through and um, they expose on a film here. Uh, here, we use a fan shaped beam of x rays to image a slice of the body, and then we do it, we take images of the body slice by slice and we can actually reconstruct that to a 3D image. And this gives us improved soft tissue contrast. So we take our beam of x-rays, it's a fan shaped x-ray beam, it's very thin but it spreads out so that it will cover the whole body. We put the patient so that they're surrounded by a ring of detectors so the x-ray machine is firing through the patient onto this ring of detectors here. Uh, there's our patient there. And then we rotate the x-ray beam around the patient, okay? It would go all the way around, it's indicated that it went around the patient. And we detect, these detectors will detect the x-ray beam at multiple angles. And once we've done one slice, the patient moves out, or or moves through the ring of detectors. So they're moving through and the x-ray beam is going round and round and collecting all this information of x-ray beams at various angles. An algorithm will then combine that data into an image slice. And because we're taking the... Um, because we're taking... moving this x-ray beam around to, at multiple angles, we get to see the amount of penetration along various lines through the patient at different angles. So the algorithm can combine that data and actually produce an image slice with great detail even of soft tissue. So it improves the contrast. And with the multiple slices, you can actually construct a 3D image. <clears throat> so you can collect the data for multiple slices so you can actually see what's, what's happening in three dimensions. There is a big negative here though. This x-ray beam is, uh, the patient's being exposed to the x-ray beam for a longer period of time, so there is a larger radiation dose here. This is a collection of pictures of CT scans. This is of the head. So you can see this is the top of the head. This is the lower part of the head. And so we're working the way down as we go this way. You can start to see brain tissue here, brain, uh, and if I'm not sure if it will come out on the pit on the video, but you can actually see details in the soft tissue. So by measuring the amount of absorption through similar areas from different angles, you can collect that information to find out differences even in soft tissue, which an ordinary X-ray couldn't do. So those are uses of x-rays. We've looked at conventional x-rays and CAT scans which use x-rays. Now we're going to move on to some methods that use different rays, which are gamma rays. So we're looking at radioactive traces here. If we put gamma-emitting radionuclides into the body, because gamma rays have very high penetration, we can track them through the body if we can detect that gamma ray and turn it into, or those gamma rays, and turn them into useful information about where they originated in the body. So that's the principle for using radioactive traces. We put something in the body, it emits gamma rays, we detect them, find out where they came from, and that means we can f see how that trace is moving through the body. So that's why we use gamma rays, because they're very penetrating. 
There are sophisticated detectors outside the body which can provide us with the information about where the radionuclide originated. Technetium 99M is a very common tracer. It's a gamma emitter, doesn't emit any other type of radiation, just gamma. It has a half-life of six hours. That's useful. That means you've got enough time there to complete your survey of the patient before the number of decay events get so small that it's not providing you any useful information. It's also not so long, you know, it's not a month, half-life of a month, so that you could do your study, but then uh, you, you've left that radionuclide in the body such that the patient is being exposed for a very long time. So it's a good time, six hours, that's the physical half-life. The biological half-life is also six hours. Uh, but I'm not going to go into biological half-life here. So, good, good half-life. And also, the gamma rays are at a good energy level. So, not all gamma rays are equal. You know that on the electromagnetic spectrum, there is a region occupied by gamma rays. So, there are gamma rays with different frequencies. Therefore, the photons have different energies. Some gamma photons are don't provide as good quality image data because they're, they're either too energetic for our detectors or not energetic enough. Technetium 99M emits gamma rays at a very good energy level. Then we have fludeoxyglucose. That's a beta plus emitter. So here, this is not directly emitting gamma rays. Remember, gamma rays are what we want because they're very penetrating. This is actually a beta plus emitter, but the method that it's used with is different to the standard gamma camera, which I will come on to. This is used in it as a PET tracer, which is positron emission tomography. So beta plus positron emission. Uh, when the beta plus particles are emitted in the body, they annihilate with naturally occurring electrons, producing a gamma photons. You can actually get extremely good images from PET scans, and this is a common tracer, and I'll go through that also. So let's start off with the gamma camera. The gamma camera is used to detect and then locate where a tracer is in the body. There are four main components in the gamma camera. We've got the collimator, which is at the bottom here. That's a, an array of lead tubes there. We've got the scintillator, it's a scintillating material. This behaves much like the image intensifying screens that we've seen previously with X-rays. Then we have the photomultiplier tubes, or PMTs, they have called them. So it's photomultiplier tubes. Uh, they convert the little flashes of light that we get here into electronic pulses, which are amplified, and they go. Those signals go into the computer, which then processes all of that information and interprets it so that the radiologist can understand what's going on inside the body by producing an image on the video monitor here. So those are our four main components. Let's look at each one in turn. Well, we're going to look at three. We're not going to look at the computer because there's not, you just need to know that it processes the information and turns it into an image. The collimator is an array of lead tubes. Lead, high atomic number, so it absorbs gamma rays. The purpose of it is to prevent non-parallel rays from entering the scintillator and giving us false readings. So hopefully this schematic will make that clear. Here's our incoming gamma rays. The green ones here, they're all parallel to the lead tube, so they can go straight through. They are then detected. So by detecting something here, we know that this gamma ray was emitted directly below. And we know that all of these green rays were emitted from directly below because they got through the collimator. These red ones, they're emitted at angles. So you have to understand that when the tracer is in the body, it's just throwing out those gamma rays in random directions. They're emitted in all directions, and if you just received all of them, you couldn't get any useful information about that. Remember, you don't just want to know there's gamma rays being emitted, you want to know where they came from. So, if I detected this red one here, this would have been detected over here. How would I know that it came from over there? I wouldn't know that. So 
as unfortunate as it is, I want to filter that out, I want to get rid of that. So I am losing information, my overall resolution for the image is reduced by preventing these getting through to the scintillator, but my spatial resolution is increased because I now know where my gamma rays came from. So the way that they're absorbed is this gamma ray here is going into the collimator, but it's not parallel to the tubes, so it hits the wall. Lead has high atomic number, so it will easily absorb that, and that's absorbed, prevents it getting through. Now you may get some stray gamma rays get through because even it, you know, it, depending on how it went through, possible. But um, generally speaking, you know where the gamma rays came from. So spatial resolution is already improved, but the image resolution is reduced. That's the collimator. Next stage, as I said, that's the scintillator. Here you have a process where you convert the gamma photons into many visible photons. So the energy is absorbed in a crystal such as sodium iodide and then re-emitted as light. So here's my scintillating material. I have an incoming gamma photon, it's absorbed and I get many visible photons emitted from it. So I get a little flash of light basically. That is useful as I can do something with that, with those visible photons. So it's important that you appreciate you get many visible photons from just the one gamma photon. That's because this has high energy, these have low energy, so in order to conserve energy I need to have more of them. Next stage then, the, receiving the output from the scintillator is are the photomultiplier tubes. These convert flashes of light into amplified electronic pulses. There are two main components here. We've got the photocathode and the diodes. Here's my photocathode here. It's photocathode, cathode being negative. The, these curved plates here, these are diodes. And then the top one here, that's another diode, but it's the highest positive potential, so it's the anode. You can see that each diode is at an increasingly positive potential. At the photocathode, electrons are knocked out of the photocathode by the light photons that are coming out of the scintillator. So we get an electron knocked out of here. What's the, what does the electron want to do now that it's out of the photocathode? Well, it's repelled from there because it's negative and attracted towards the diode. Now it's moving fast. When it hits the diode, it's going to hit more electrons out of this material here. So the electrons are accelerated here, that knocks some electrons out, so we get two out here in this case. And then each time the electrons hit the diode, because they, there's this increasing positive potential, the electrons will keep moving in this general direction. Each time they strike those diodes at high speed, they knock more electrons out. And eventually, because we've done that so many times, we get billions of electrons, a cascade of electrons, and they reach the anode, giving us an amplified signal. So you can see we've amplified it because we've gone from one electron to many, many electrons. The next stage after the photomultiplier tubes is the computer. That computer processes the information output from the photomultiplier tubes, turns it into an image that the radiologist can understand. Okay, looks like I forgot to put some animations in for the, these to go through point by point, so sorry about that. Uh, right, pos positron emission tomography. We've seen the gamma camera, now positron emission tomography. Instead of having the gamma rays emitted directly by our tracer, now we have positrons which then annihilate in the body to produce our gamma photons. We have a beta plus emitter. Those positrons are emitted when the tracer decays will annihilate with electrons that are already present in the body tissue where, they, where the tracer is located. That mass, because we've got matter and antimatter, the electron is matter and the positron is antimatter, they annihilate whenever they meet. That converts their mass into energy and there are two gamma photons that are produced. It's important to appreciate that for every one annihilation you get two gamma photons and they move in opposite directions. The reason they move in opposite directions is to conserve momentum 
And now you're saying to me, probably, uh, yeah, but gamma photons, they're massless, how do they have momentum? Well, I'm not explaining that, but they do have momentum, and you, you'll need to look at Einstein's theory of relativity to understand why. <coughs> uh, it's to do with, the, just in simple terms, it's to do with uh, what you mean by photons being massless. They don't have rest mass, but they do have another form of mass. So, anyway, moving on. Those photons, they move in opposite directions. Now that's very convenient. We can use, if we have a ring of detectors that detects both of those gamma photons, and we know we can measure the time difference between receiving them, we can use that to locate where they were emitted in the body, and moreover, we can do that and locate them in 3D space. So here's a schematic of the PET scan. We've got our patient in the middle, and our ring of detectors, much like the CAT scan. And the patient has got a tracer inside them, okay? Uh, but we're, um, rather than starting the tracer, I'm actually going to start at the point where we detect, some, detect the gamma photons. So we get a pair of detections here and here. And there was a time difference between those detections. So we've got that time delay. I'm going to call that detection 1A and detection 1B, okay, because they are a pair of detections, so they are related to each other. This was one, this was the other, so it's A and B, all right? The distance from that site of detection to where they were, where that was emitted from, is D1, and the Distance between this detection and where it was emitted from is D2, okay? D1 and D2 are not equal. It's not like they were emitted half, halfway, from halfway between the, where they were detected, but they were at some point along this line. Where exactly, I don't know. How do I know it's along this line? Well, because they were moving in opposite directions, so in order to have arrived here and here, they must have, must have been emitted along that line between them, okay? So I know that they are emitted along there somewhere, and this distance is D1 and D2, but I don't know what D1 and D2 are yet. The total distance I know because I've constructed this ring of detectors, and I can quickly calculate where that site is in space and where that site is in space, so I know the total distance, okay? So D is known, this capital D, and the total distance is equal to the sum of those individual distances, D1 and D2. The speed times the time delay will give me the difference in the distances from the, uh, this is from detector A to the site, and detector B to the site, okay? So, D2 minus D1 will be equal to the speed times the time delay. Now I know how fast gamma photons travel, so they travel at the speed of light. And there, there might, may well be some corrections you need to make here, because they're not just travelling through air the whole time, they're travelling through the body, travelling through, possibly travelling through detectors, depends how thick the detectors are. But I know how fast they go anyway, and I know how fast they go in different materials. So D2 minus D1 is equal to V delta T. V is the speed at which the photons are travelling, delta T is the time delay. Now I can combine my equations by substituting, so D minus D1 will give me D2, I can substitute that into equation 2 here. So now I've got V delta T is equal to D minus 2D1. Now I have a method for solving for D1 here in terms of the speed which I know, the time delay which I know, and the dis total distance which I also know. So that means I can find D1, and that means I can locate where they originated in 3D space. And then, so that's for one detection. You have an algorithm that quickly calculates the position for uh, where the tracer was located, but the tracer isn't located in just one position, it's spread throughout the body, it's going through various systems in the body. So you're going to get, you're going to want lots of detections to locate where they are, 
So this detection was from slightly above the first one, and then you get another detection, and so on. So you get these detections, so you know that the tracer is distributed here, and you can plot that, and turn it into a 3D image, and then you might even have detections that mean the, the you've also got some tracer located over here, so it's actually in a different part of the body, so that is quite possible as well. And here is a 3D image from a PET scan where you can see the location and the relative intensity of the location of the tracer in the body. What I mean by relative intensity is there's more tracer here, so we're getting more, more uh, detections that arise because of emissions there where it's red. Okay, and you can see that the trace is not just in one position in the body, but it's distributed around places. So that's a PET scan. Ultrasound, now we're going to start looking at ultrasound images. And these do not use X-rays, nor do they use gamma rays. They are sound waves which have a frequency which is beyond the range of human hearing. So Humans, we can hear up to about 20 kilohertz, usually it's less than that. And ultrasounds have um, frequencies higher than that. Sound waves are non-ionizing, so that's a, good, that's a good feature of using ultrasound. It's not ionizing, so it doesn't have that harmful property that X-rays and gamma rays have. The way that it's produced is by the resonance of piezoelectric crystals. What a piezoelectric crystal is one that deforms when you apply a potential difference across it. Okay, so you put put potential difference across the crystal and it will contract, or if you reverse it, it will expand. If you then have an alternating potential difference, that can cause the crystal to vibrate, and if you manage to match the natural frequency, you can get resonance occur, and then that piezoelectric crystal will produce ultrasound. So here's an ultrasound transducer schematic. We've got a few main components here. We've got a pulsed AC supply here. So that's providing the alternating potential difference across our crystal there. These electrodes connect the pulsed AC supply to either side of the crystal. So that's our crystal. One electrode is on one side, one is on the other. Here's an electric crystal that produces ultrasound when it resonates. And then uh, this process also works in reverse. So if ultrasound is incident on the piezoelectric crystal, it will cause it to resonate, causing an alternating PD to be produced across the crystal. So you can receive that. That means you can see, use exactly the same transducer as a receiver. In order to do so, you're going to need something to stop it vibrating once you produce the pulse of ultrasound. So ultrasound transducers produce ultrasound impulses. They transmit a pulse and then they receive. Transmit, receive. And this epoxy resin backing prevents it from vibrating into the receiving phase. Okay, so I think we've covered everything there. How do, how do we get a signal to receive from ultrasound? The way is through reflection. When ultrasound reaches a boundary between two media, which would be, again, we're in a medical context here, so two different tissues, like soft, uh, sorry, um, skin and muscle, when it crosses that boundary, there is partial refraction and reflection. So some of it will refract into the new medium, like muscle, and some of it will reflect and stay in the skin and come back. So we've got I0 indicating that's the incident intensity of the ultrasound. IT is transmitted into the new, new medium and IR is reflected from that boundary. Those reflected pulses are then used to determine the location of the boundary in terms of its depth, how far away it is from the transducer and the type of tissue because the, depending on the type of tissue you have here, that will, or the, if you have, the amount of reflection you get here 
changes depending on which tissue it's going from and to. Now, in order to understand that in terms of the intensities, we first need to cover this new quantity here, which is acoustic impedance. Z is equal to the density multiplied by the speed of, the, of sound in that material. So this is density of the material, of the tissue, and the speed of sound in that tissue. Z is the acoustic impedance here. So again, you've got another case where you've got to be careful of the context for what Z is. You know, Z is, this is not an atomic number here. Units of kilogram per meter squared per second. So now we can look at the equation that tells us what the intensity of the reflected pulse will be based on the acoustic impedance. IR, that's our reflected intensity over I0, so this ratio here is equal to Z2 minus Z1 all squared over Z2 plus Z1 all squared. If you have a case, uh, so Z1 is what we started off in, that's the, what the ultrasound is travelling through, that tissue, Z2 is what it's crossing into. If we have a case where Z2 is approximately equal to Z1, so the acoustic impediances of the two tissues are very similar, then the reflected intensity will be approximately zero. Right? You can see that where they're equal, this top line will go to zero, so IR is going to be zero multiplied by IR zero. So the reflect that means you get no reflection. Most of the ultrasound, if not all of it, went into the new tissue. That's like as if almost as if there is no boundary. If Z2 is much larger than Z1, then these two terms, because the, that is so different to that and the same down here, these two terms are pretty much equal, meaning that IR will be equal to I0. And that means that all of the, all of the incident ultrasound is reflected at that boundary. So where you have a large difference in the acoustic impedances, most of it just bounce off that boundary. A good example of that is air and skin. Air has a very low acoustic impedance, much lower than the skin. So if you just take your ultrasound transducer and hold it so that it's in front of, or it's in the air, but just near some skin, most of the ultrasound will just bounce off it. It's not going to go into the skin, it's not going to go into the body. Therefore, when you actually want to use an ultrasound transducer effectively, you're going to need a coupling gel. The coupling gel means that uh, the coupling gel has an acoustic impedance roughly equal to that of skin. So if, you, if the ultrasound transducer is embedded in some coupling gel which is on the skin, then that means that because the ultrasound is already in a um, uh, medium with similar acoustic impedance to the skin, it will go into the skin and therefore into the body, you can get some useful information. So that's how you work, work with the reflected intensity equation. Let's look at some principles for actually collecting data then. We've got A scans first. The A scan determines the depth of the boundaries between tissue and the tissue types. So where you have, you know, a boundary between sort of skin and muscle, uh, it will detect where that boundary is in terms of its depth. The way that that's done is the time that is the time that elapses between transmitting and receiving. You can use that because you know how fast the ultrasound is travelling. So you've got speed, you've got time. You can work out the depth. Uh, the reflected intensity tells you what the tissue type is. That relates to what the equation that we just saw. Okay, so you, each tissue type, you know the acoustic impedance of it. So you can then work out, based on the, the intensity of the reflected pulse, what tissue type you had. So this would be what a graph might look like. We've got our voltage for, for our signal here. And this is the time. So we've got a pulse here. That's our 
transmitted pulse, so that's what we transmitted into the body. And then we receive these pulses here. And the tissue thickness would be given by a half times this time delay multiplied by the speed of the sound in that tissue type. So the reason it's half is because this time is the time taken for the pulse to go to the boundary and be reflected back to the transducer. So you only want half of that time. Half of the time is the time it took to go from transducer to the boundary. So that would give you the tissue thickness, a half delta T times C. So the A scan tells you the depth to the boundary, <coughs> and then it tells you <coughs> excuse me, what the new tissue type is. <coughs> excuse me. Right, um, ultrasound B scans. These use multiple A scans to produce a 2D image. The, the way that you use, the way that you construct a transducer is to have multiple transmission elements and therefore you're detecting the depth and tissue types at multiple lines from the transducer. Dots are used to represent the position at which the boundaries are and then each dot has a different brightness to indicate the intensity that was reflected. So here's our multiple transmitting elements. They're going to transmit ultrasound into the body here, and here we've got an organ, okay? And the ultrasound travels through the organ. Now as it does so, as it's going from this tissue to the new tissue at that boundary, it's going to reflect. Okay, so we'll get some reflected uh, waves here, back here, and we can use that to plot the, we can use that information to plot the location of that boundary, okay? And then we'll get a reflected pulse that associates with that boundary, that boundary, that boundary. Then obviously the ultrasound continues into the new tissue as well, because some of it was transmitted into it. So it transmits into the tissue, and then it re reaches another boundary behind. So we're going to get some information about that boundary as well. So it's going to reflect and come out, we'll get our information. So we can plot the locations of the boundaries on the back. Well. And then we put those dots onto a screen so that we know where these boundaries are. Now, you can see at the moment I'm not getting very much useful information. I don't know much about the shape of that organ. That's ultimately what I want to do. Uh, so, what I would do ideally is have more transmitting elements to transmit in between these transmitting elements, so I can receive, send and receive more ultrasound pulses and get more information. So I could then plot information for those points as well, and then when I plot those on my screen as well, you can now start to see the image forming, so I can now get some useful information. So you have lots and lots of these transmitting elements to get a clearer image. The more you have, the better the image you get, the higher resolution. I mean, if just this is not something that you'd have to talk about in an exam for certain, but if you imagine the kind of algorithms that would be required to gather this information, it's quite astonishing, really. Let's look at this pulse going on here. It's reflected here, so we get a reflected pulse, and some is transmitted, okay? So with that, okay, fairly straightforward. But then it's now we've got a reduced pulse that then reaches this boundary. Some of it will be transmitted through, and some of it is going to be reflected. And then when it reaches this boundary, that reflected pulse is going to be reflected and refracted here. So what we actually get back here is not what was actually reflected here, because it's going to interact with this boundary also. So then you'll get another reflected pulse going back there, and a refracted one here, which we receive. So actually, the kind of algorithms required are pretty complex. Anyway, moving on. Uh, this is an ultrasound image, uh, so you can see uh, the, this, is, this image is formed by lots and lots of those dots. And that is actually an ultrasound image of my daughter who was born not so long ago. So that's 
uh, in the womb. And that's a very common use for ultrasound. That is um, very useful for looking at babies in the womb because it's not ionising, so it's not going to do the baby any harm. So it's, um, especially when you have lots of cellular reproduction taking place, which there is in young babies, cells are most susceptible to uh, radiation damage when cells are dividing. So uh, you really want to avoid using ionising radiation on uh, babies whilst they're still in the womb, if at all possible, and ultrasound provides a way of doing that. <coughs> now I will talk about the Doppler effect, <coughs> named after Doppler, who was an Austri Austrian physicist, and that is beca because we will see how the Dopp Doppler effect is also used in ultrasound. When you have relative motion between a source of waves and a an observer or a detector, then you get a change in the wavelength and frequency of the wave. Now let's have a look at stationary source to see what we mean. So we get our stationary source and you see that the wavelength is constant wherever you are observing from, okay, as long as the observer is stationary also. Okay, so if we observe from here, the wavelength is the same as if we observe from over here and so on. The wave and the wavelength is not changing at all. But now we will look at what happens if the source is moving toward the observer. So keeping the frequency the same in terms of producing the, the ultrasound, the source will be moving towards the observer and those, there's our waves being formed there. You can see that these wave fronts are closer together. Remember the distance between wave fronts that's the wavelength. So the wavelength is shorter here. The observer will receive shorter wavelength. And behind the source, if we have an observer behind, for them, the wavelength is increased, the wavelength is bigger. So higher frequency and lower frequency uh, corresponding to the change in wavelength. Okay? And uh, we have an equation to indicate or to relate the speed of the source and the observer, the, the relative speed between the source and the observer, which is V, and the change in wavelength. So delta lambda is the change in wavelength, lambda is the original wavelength, and V is the speed of the source or the observer. If the observer is moving towards the source, you get the same thing happening and C is the speed of the wave. So as I said, the effect is the same if the observer is moving towards or away from the source as well. So how is this used with ultrasound? There's our equation. Uh, Doppler ultrasounds measure the speed of blood cells in arteries. Okay. So here's our ultrasound transducer. It transmits some ultrasound kind of a line towards the moving blood cells, the blood cells are moving. Now, when they reflect the ultrasound and the ultrasound comes back here, you'll have a shifted wavelength, okay? And it's important to note there are actually two shifts in the wavelength. When the ultrasound is produced by the transducer, the blood cell is behaving like an observer and it's moving towards the transducer. So for that reason, the wavelength will be reduced. Okay? So the wave, wavelength of the wave arriving at the blood cell is reduced. That's for a case where it's moving towards the transducer, obviously. And when it reflects the, the wave, it's shortened again, the wavelength. So uh, there, it's behaving like a source that is moving towards the transducer. Okay, so it reflects waves, and by reflecting them, it behaves like a source. Okay, so we've got the first shift in wavelength happens at transmission, and the second one happens at reflection. And if the blood was moving away, then you would get an increase in the wavelength 
and you get two increases in wave length corresponding to this. So that's what is using Doppler ultrasound. And you can also superimpose the, the information you get from this with the 2D ultrasound so that you can plot out where the arteries are and actually record the blood speed, the speed of blood in the arteries directly on that image. So that is Doppler, the Doppler effect and Doppler ultrasound. Last thing we need to look at is MRI before I look at some advantages and disadvantages of the techniques. Nuclei, atomic nuclei, have magnetic properties. They have, because they're spinning, they have a magnetic polarity and that's because actually because the electric charge in the nuclei is not evenly distributed. So you've got moving charges, it gives them a magnetic property. Now normally, the, these nuclei in some material, and again we're in a medical context here, so within the human body, those nuclei are randomly aligned. But if you put the body into a strong, uniform magnetic field, then they, the nuclei and the main contributing nucleus for MRI is R or R, hydrogen nuclei. So hydrogen nuclei will align with the magnetic field and they precess around it. Precession is a motion like this gyroscope is showing you on this animation. Okay? The gyroscope is precessing around uniform gravitational field lines. So the gravitational field lines vertical and it's precessing around them. So it's got a spinning disc and then that the axis of the spinning disc rotates around the field lines. And nuclei will do the same thing in a magnetic field. But you need to have a strong magnetic field that needs to be uniform. The frequency at which they precess is called the Larmor frequency and that is proportional to the magnetic field strength. So this is our Larmor frequency that's proportional to magnetic field strength. So if you double the magnetic field strength you'll double the Larmor frequency. That's useful, that gives you a way to control the Larmor frequency for the nuclei in the body. When you have precessing nuclei, they can resonate by flipping into a high energy state. When they flip into the high energy state, their magnetic polarity reverses. So here's our nucleus, it's, uh, it was precessing. We then fired in some radio photons, and one of the radio photons that had a frequency equal to the Larmor frequency for that nucleus. It was the photon was absorbed by the nucleus. That gave it sufficient energy to flip into that high energy state and its magnetic polarity reversed. Now, why a radio photon? You need electromagnetic radiation that has a frequency equal to the Larmor frequency and the Larmor frequency is in the radio range of frequencies, so that's why you need a radio photon. Alright, so that was resonance. Now, after that nucleus has been in the high energy state, eventually it's going to flip back to the normal energy state. And energy has to be conserved, so in going from a high energy state to a low energy state, it needs to lose some energy, it does so in the form of a radio photon. And when we receive that radio photon, we know that nuclei have relaxed, or when we receive those photons, we know the nuclei have relaxed. The time that it takes between transmitting and receiving the, those radio photons gives us a time called the relaxation time. So here's our photon, uh, our nucleus, it's in the high energy state, and it flips back into the low energy state, emitted a radio photon. Okay? Now, the nuclei. In hydrogen nuclei in different tissues have different relaxation times. So you use the relaxation time to identify what tissue you've got. This is a schematic of an MRI scanner. First thing, we've got a large magnet here. That provides the uniform, strong, uniform magnetic field that the patient is inside. So there's our patient there. We have gradient coils. 
They provide a magnetic field as well, and the magnetic field strength of these is adjusted to vary the field strength throughout the body, and that varies the Larmor frequency throughout the body. Next up, we've got the radio frequency coil and the generator and receiver. So this generates a signal, which is then transmitted into the body, so we transmit those radio photons into the body. And when the nuclei relax, they give off a signal, which is received by the coil and then interpreted by the receiver. And then we have the computer and monitor. The computer controls all of this, and then you have a monitor which displays the image so that the radiologist can interpret what's happening. Okay? So if we're interpreting, if we're looking at this part of the body, we make sure that it has this part of the body has a Larmor frequency, a specific Larmor frequency. We send in radio frequency pulses at that frequency. We then record the time suite between sending the radio frequency pulse into the body and then receiving it, and that gives us the relaxation time. Now that volume needs to be very, very small, because each volume that you scan forms a pixel of the image. You want to have a good image, you need more pixels, so that means the volume of the body needs to be, that you scan each time needs to be very, very small. And if you, if you were doing a, a large volume, then you might have multiple tissue types in there, so you get conflicting information. So you need to make it very small, so that you've just got one tissue type in that volume, and you can get some useful information out of it. So here are the uh, principles then for MRI scanners. You, sh you alter the magnetic field strength with your gradient coils to specify a tiny volume of the body which is located in 3D space, so you actually have multiple gradient coils to vary the strength of the field along the body and then in the X and Y directions also. So you, you isolate that part of the body because it has a specific Larmor frequency. You then transmit radio photons at that frequency, that causes the nuclei to resonate. Just in that volume, they don't resonate anywhere else because the Larmor frequency for everywhere else is different. Then you have the relaxation time, that the time between sending and receiving the signal gives you the relaxation time. You then use that to identify at that volume what type of tissue you have. Is it muscle? Is it fat? Is it something else? And because the, these volumes are very, very small, your patient is going to have to stay still for a long time whilst you gather that information. So that is uh, one of the drawbacks. And the stiller the patient is, the better the information you can get. Okay, so uh, that's MRI scans. And I'll, we'll talk about some of the advantages and disadvantages of that. Uh, but first, here is, I've given you proof that I have a heart maybe, and proof that I have a brain now. That's my head. Anyway, so I have actually got a brain, which is nice to know. All right, um, but actually I did want to say something else about that. If it's gonna, let me go back. Um, notice the soft tissue contrast that you get with MRI. Big advantage of MRI is excellent soft tissue contrast. So you can see great detail. And you can actually do different pulse sequences of the radio fruit, radio waves, of the radio photons you send in to actually highlight specific tissue types as well. Right, um, the imaging advantages and disadvantages. Here are different types of medical imaging. You'll notice these top four I've given an asterisk to. Rather than writing down and the disadvantages for each one of those that they're ionising, I've indicated all of the ionising ones here. So these are the ones that can remove electrons from atoms in high ions. These ones don't use ionising radiation. Okay, so you've got some advantages of x-rays. They're cheap, they are quick. It's a very well-established technology, um, but they are ionising. 
get poor soft tissue contrast, and it only gives you 2D image, which has all of the layers of the body superimposed on top of one another. So it's limited information you get from it. CAT scans, you can get 3D, 3D images, you get good soft tissue contrast, and they are faster than MRI images. So MRI would be the gold standard for soft tissue contrast, but CAT scans are faster than MRI. With a CAT scan though, you get much larger radiation dose, and it's more expensive than x-rays. Obviously, you've got higher, higher technology. Gamma camera, you can get dynamic information from these, so that's very useful. Um, so you can actually do studies over time. You can also do a wide range of studies with those. You don't get very good resolution with these images. It's a high radiation dose for the patient, so the, the perceived benefit from doing that has to outweigh this big disadvantage here. Then you've also got radioactive waste to dispose of. And, and you've got radioactive materials that you need to handle as well. So you need to have special areas set aside in the hospital with adequate protection, good training for your staff and so on. PET scans, 3D image, because you're locating the tracer in 3D space. Very good information here. You get dynamic information here also. Uh, again, radiation dose and disposal of radioactive waste are issues there. Uh, ultrasound is non-ionizing, it's cheap and it's quick, but there are limited ap applications with it. So for example, you can't scan the brain. It'd be great if you could, but because your brain is surrounded by the skull with a much higher acoustic impedance than the skin and the soft tissue inside, you're going to get a lot of reflection and therefore you can't get any, any useful information out of it. And then lastly, the MRI scan. It's non-ionizing because you're using radio waves and magnetic fields, so that's not a problem. Uh, high resolution imaging, excellent soft tissue contrast, but they are super expensive, especially if you have the liquid nitrogen called magnets, super superconducting magnets. They are slow, they take a long time to do. You need compliant patients, and I should have put in there as well, that patients who have metal, metallic implants can't have MRIs as well because you've got very powerful magnets which could rip them out or move them and cause serious problems. And there we go, that's uh, medical imaging. Now, I am trying desperately hard to do cosmology. Uh, I've started it, I'm part way through. Hopefully, I will do that as well. Um, so, I hope I will get it done because I will. I want to get it done for you guys. Um, anyway, I'll let you know if I manage to get it done.